But if we're never paying attention to our emotions, eventually they will get our attention. Hi, I'm Carl Vaders, and welcome to The Church Lobby, conversations on faith and ministry. My guest in this episode is Ian Borkent, and we'll be talking about going beyond burnout by growing a healthy soul. Ian is a pastor with the C3 Rivers Church in the Netherlands, and he's the founder of Grow a Healthy Soul. In this episode, we'll talk about the causes of pastoral burnout, how to avoid it, how to recruit church members to the task of helping us avoid burnout by employing the fivefold ministry gifts. If you've been around this podcast for a while, you know we've talked about the subject before. And yes, we're going to talk about it again even after this one. Why? Because it's so prevalent. Even in this podcast, Ian at one point talks about if this is your first burnout, here's what to do. Yes, burnout happens so much, we're starting to number them. Also, we want to let you know that the countdown continues for the arrival of my new book, Desizing the Church, How Church Growth Became a Science, Then an Obsession, and What's Next. It's coming April the 2nd, 2024, and it's available now for pre-sale anywhere you buy books. Actually, in this episode, as a natural part of the conversation, I'll be sharing some of the content of the book, including how our obsession with bigness is a major contributing factor in pastoral burnout, in church scandals, and so much more. Well, hello there, Ian. It is good to have you on the podcast with us today. Good to be here with you, Carl. Well, we, I am in California. You are in the Netherlands. It's noon here, and it's what time in the Netherlands for you? It's just past 9 p.m. Oh, so I, I said good afternoon earlier when we before we recorded, but it's just about time for good night for you. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, now, I've spent time in Europe, and in fact, shortly after this uh, airs, I will be fairly close to you, but not quite close enough to see you. I'll be in uh, in northern Germany, Switzerland, and Austria for a little while as well, doing some small church conferences there. So I know a little bit about Europe and, and the spiritual state of that, but I've never been to the Netherlands. Tell us, first of all, just because we have a primarily American audience, we have it's international, but primarily American. What is the spiritual climate in the Netherlands? What are, what are the benefits and the challenges that the church is facing there? Yes, it's a lot like uh, the rest of Western Europe, where we are, you know, we've been very Christianized, of course, in the last couple of centuries. However, in the last couple of decades, we've become very, very secularized. So uh, my, my parents' generation, most of them, they would still grow up in the church or they would know people that are, were uh, Christians or attending church. But the current generation, a lot of people, they they have not even heard about Jesus or but they're very open. They're very, very. They're more open, I think, than the previous generation because in the previous generation there was also a lot of aversion against uh, religion, you know, and the things in the church that were not so healthy, and 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 so people have left the church, uh, very secularized, also very open. So there are opportunities as well. Wondering if that's kind of a move from modernism into postmodernism as well, where postmodernism may not have the the rules of, of modernism, but there's an openness to new things that uh, a lot of modernist folks didn't have. I think so. Yes. That's nice to hear that there's some hopefulness in that. Obviously, in that there's going to be some move, obviously, towards towards spirituality that is not healthy, but uh, it's nice to know that there is at least an openness to that. So uh, as a pastor and as a church in, in the Netherlands, how does this opening to spirituality among young people, how does that uh, manifest itself? And are there things that the church in the Netherlands is doing to respond or to adapt to that? I think around COVID, a lot of things changed. Because before, I think we were hiding within the building too much. But because of COVID, we were literally forced out of our buildings. And some ministries have arisen that are literally out on the streets, uh, worshiping Jesus, with professional sound systems and, you know, not in a weird kind of way or not in a way that enforces itself on, onto the uh, onlookers, but in a beautiful way, just singing 
great worship songs and, and invading the public space in a really positive way. And some of those things are still going. I think that's one way that the church has realized we've been hiding in the building too much. I'm hoping that that can be something that maybe now uh, you can teach us as Americans about how to do outside of the building ministry uh, well also. So that's that's great to hear. Now, you oversee a ministry called Grow a Healthy Soul. They can find that at growahealthysoul.com, and we'll put links to that in the show notes. So why did you start this ministry? You just don't have enough to do as a pastor or— I'm doing less and less, to be honest, because oh, really? yeah, we, we, we've discovered a, a five-fold way of, of leading the church. Maybe we, we will get to that later. But at the same time, having gone through a, a burnout after COVID, I think I was running on adrenaline through the COVID years. And we even bought a building, our very first church building in 2020. So I was basically running on adrenaline and then after COVID, I collapsed and I had to recover for about 10 months. And then I realized there were quite some things inside of me that I was not aware of and some blind spots and some unhealthy things in my uh, emotional management, in my in my thinking. And, and I suddenly realized I've been focused a lot on church health in the last 15 years of pastoring. And I realized, wait a minute, you know, if, if there's these things after 15 years that I am seeing in me, and, and we also had some really good uh, discussions and talks in the team, then, you know, I had this passion to help other leaders prevent what I had to go through and also just create more awareness towards emotional health. Comes out of your own fairly recent experience then. So uh, given that it's still fairly fresh for you, what are some of the symptoms that pastors should look for to have some understanding of what whether or not they're experiencing is burnout or some other type of emotional crisis? Actually, here's how I'm going to do it, very differently than I usually do. I'm going to give you a confession. I am talking to you right now as an exhausted man. Mm. I am tired. We went through a very busy season. I got another very busy season coming up. And mm. the last couple of weeks that we had put in the calendar who have nothing in it to slow down with ways to rest and recover, we weren't able to do because we had extenuating, extenuating circumstances that came up with the family, emergencies that had to be dealt with. And so the recovery time that we had scheduled turned into emergency surgery time, not actual surgery. Well, actually there was. My daughter actually had surgery uh, as one of the many factors. And so I'm tired right now. Now I have over the next two weeks before the next busy season begins, I've rescheduled that so that I have two busy work days, this being one of them over the next two weeks, but the rest of them are downtime. So unless something else interrupts, I will get the recovery that I know I need. Now I'm saying all of that because of this. I'm calling myself exhausted and tired and not burnt out. I've been through burnout. I think I've been through enough of it to know the difference, but when I was burned out, I was calling it, I'm just tired for a long time too. So how does a pastor know the difference between, well, it's just been a busy season and I'm exhausted, which is a normal thing when you're busy, or I'm burnt out? How do they tell the difference between those two? Well, unfortunately, when it's too late, often. <laughs> so mm. I appreciate your transparency about this. And I think a lot of pastors w will relate to this. I mean, we've all been in these seasons where we plan in some rest, but then these things happen and suddenly it's like we're stretching ourselves too thin. And, uh, you know, the same thing for me. But uh, what I think is, is happening with burnout is that you're right. It, you can only go on for so long. It's like it, it's one thing after the other, and it is not really uh, realizing what's going on, even ignoring some inner warnings or uh, friends often there if you have some good friends around you they would say things they would warn you hey you know you need to take a break uh, you need to schedule some rest but then if you just keep going and you ignore all that and i think that is well actually it's it's uh, scientifically they did some research around this and they've seen that people who used to have a burnout they are more prone to having another one and it's probably to do with the type of personality that you are. So we need to be even more aware that we won't get another one. 
you, you say most of us don't realize it until we're too late. Too late looks like looks like what? I think I'm aware of some of the symptoms because I know what I had. And, and maybe I'll add to yours as we go through. What are some of those things that too late look like? I think if, if you've been through one, especially if it's been a pretty full-on experience, then you will realize the warning flags much earlier, right? I mean, it's not that... Of course, you've learned from the past. So you're definitely going to be more careful, especially if it's if it's a first burnout. Often, yeah, we don't realize until it's too late. And why is that? I find it is because our minds are always playing catch up to our body. So I think Pete Scazzaro says that the body is a major prophet. So often we will start to feel things in our body, such as migraines, headaches, back pain, sleeplessness, like some symptoms. And, and we can initially think that it has a physical cause. You know, I, I must have a bad back because I was working in the backyard or something. But we need to listen to our bodies and heed the early warning signs. For me, I just didn't do that. And I uh, eventually my body started screaming back pain. Yeah, it was just too late to take a week a week off and, and continue. I, I needed, I had hit a wall that, that I needed to recover from for months. There's actually a saying in the mental health community, the body keeps the score. I believe it's actually the title of a book about neuroscience and recovery. The body keeps the score. So our bodies will tell us there's a problem before our minds know there's a problem. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So how do we, how do we pay more attention to our bodies? Because as ministers, we really spend, we are involved in the life of the mind. We're not out there, most of us, unless we're bivocational. Most of us are not out there working with our physical bodies particularly, but obviously our bodies are involved in everything, whether I'm sitting at a computer monitor all day or sitting and counseling someone or standing up and preaching. It's primarily a mental and emotional and spiritual thing, but obviously our bodies are involved in all of that. So how do we as ministers what do we need to do to pay more attention to the physical warning signs that are going to scream for us to pay attention here? There's something wrong. Well, the first thing is to just slow down and take the time to listen, which is very difficult because we often are stuck in a rut and we have our, our rhythms and, and, and we get up and immediately we look on our phone or whatever. Maybe we, we will still look on it one second before we go to bed, but we need to purposefully add in some moments to just sit down and do nothing or think nothing. And uh, I've learned that the hard way that I, what I do is I sit down without distractions. So I turn off my, my phone and I, and I do some deep breathing because if I breathe deeply, then I get a lot of oxygen into my blood and that helps me just connect to, you know, my emotions. I have found it very difficult in the past to connect with my emotions. It's not the way I was raised. But we're all, we're a triune being, just like God. We are spirit, soul, and body. So, but if we're never paying attention to our emotions, eventually they will get our attention, in my case, via my body. And so what I do, I, I sit down or I sit down and I just breathe in deeply. And then I ask myself some questions. I have a list of questions that I, I can share with you in a, in a PDF that I'm, that I'm often asking myself, such as, you know, how, how are you really doing? Or what are you upset about? Or what do you need right now? These kind of things. It's like you're counseling yourself. <laughs> and, and then to write it down, writing down the answers. And there's something in, in the art of journaling or writing stuff down, the pace of it and the act of it. For me, it's, it's very rejuvenating. Okay. Yeah, we'll make sure we put link to that PDF in the show notes, because I, I like the idea of, especially for pastors who maybe have not addressed these issues before, the idea of going and sitting down with another pastor or a counselor or somebody and uh, opening up their life situation to them feels very intimidating, feels like they're admitting failure or something, and it's really hard for us to do. But the idea that I can sit down and make some self-assessment not as the ultimate answer, but as some first steps sounds like a really good thing to me. What do you think, what is it about, you even used the word phrase earlier, if you're going through your first burnout, and I almost laughed out loud when you said first burnout, because I thought, well, have we really gotten to the point where it's like, 
It's like yeah, there was the World War, and then we started, had to call it World War One because we had another one come along. And it's like so it's no longer burnout; it's burnout one, burnout two. What is it about pastors that were so susceptible to burnout that we have to start numbering them now? Oh, that's yeah, that that, that is that is pretty crazy, isn't it? That it's it's not just pastors; it is it's right it's rising like crazy in the world, like the burnout rates. I think we're under so much more pressure than in any time in history. I remember my parents, one of them worked, you know, and the other one was at home with the kids. Now in the mm -hmm. Netherlands, both of the men and women need to work to make ends meet. It's just the pressure of life in general for anyone. And then it's personality type. There are pastors that are on a, 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 yeah, a large load of, of stress and responsibilities, but because maybe they're a more phlegmatic personality, they find it easier to deal with things or I think it's it's so it's life it's personality type and then yeah the pastorate itself of course there are a lot of expectations but in my case to be honest you know all, people always say there's so many expectations but to be honest in my case I expected so many things from me <laughs> and so it was my own pressure that I put on myself that eventually led me to burn out and now a short break to talk about something else. If you like the content you're hearing, here are two things you can do for us. First, forward this podcast to a friend. Second, consider becoming a financial supporter through Patreon, Venmo, or PayPal. Just go to carlvaders.com support. For as little as $3 a month, you can help us put these resources into the hands of the ministries that need them the most. Our support link is in the show notes. And when we're done with this, we're going to do about five to 10 minutes of bonus content. Uh, if you're listening to this and you like the bonus content, you can get it by going to carlbaders.com support. And if you're supporting us on a regular basis, you get the free, you get a link to the free content, or you can get it for free by simply subscribing to our weekly newsletter that comes out every Friday by going to carlbaders.com slash subscribe. When we do go to the bonus content, we're going to talk about uh, how the church can help the pastor uh, lead beyond burnout. Uh, both by recovering from it and by preventing it. So if you're interested in the bonus content, stick around for that or go to my YouTube channel for that. But as we move along with this, though, uh, so we've talked about some of what burnout looks like, the fact that it's so common today, but are pastors slower than others to ask for the kind of help that we need? Because it seems like we're not very quick to ask for help when we need it. Is that a perception for me? Is that different in the Netherlands than in America, perhaps? But are pastors slow to ask for it? And if so, why do you think that is? Yes, I think they are. And I think it is because of a, some kind of an image that we either feel we should carry or that we think people have of us. And, and the pastor on a pedestal, it, it's just not healthy. There is too much. I, I always say it, I compare it to Moses, you know, in the Old Testament, he thought he had to counsel everyone, like the whole people of Israel. And then Jethro, his father-in-law, he came and gave him some wisdom on how to divide tasks and, and, and set up leaders and so forth. So somehow we... I think pastors tend to have this uh, have this Moses expectation of themselves. And some people, there are people who also have that expectation of their pastor. But I believe that we're moving into a church season where we will be much less hierarchical because it, it has turned out to be not healthy. If you look at the church scandals, it's to do with a lot of pastors who are just under pressure and they're on too high of a pedestal. And they're falling because, <laughs> because it's just not healthy. It's not how we're supposed to live as humans. You mentioned that, and it reminds me of, I've got a new book coming out in April. And so if you're listening to this shortly after this podcast comes out, it's still on its way called Desizing the Church. But in it, I make the proposal that our obsession in the church with bigger numbers may be the biggest but least acknowledged contributing factor to pastoral burnout, to church scandals, to divisiveness, to a misallocation of resources, 
so many of the church and pastoral dysfunctions we find can often be tied to, not exclusively, but can often be tied to this drive for bigger, bigger, bigger. And if your church isn't getting bigger, then you're stuck or you're unhealthy or whatever. And and that's part of the, you know, this whole ministry is about helping small churches thrive. And the first step in that is to realize that small churches can thrive. You don't have to get bigger. Now, I know I expect that the drive for bigger is not the same in Europe as it is in America, but how much do you think that drive to get bigger is a factor in pastoral burnout and dysfunction? Oh, yes, uh, it is. And and the, the comparison game and, you know, the social media, I think there is a generational change, though. It's already here and it's, it's coming more and more that I find that in the 80s, the 90s, the early 2000s, there, there was a lot of focus on that, right? We need to, we need to be big. Uh, mega churches, we need to influence the world. And it's like if you are a pastor, you had these metrics, and the first metric is church attendance, church membership. And but now I think more and more people are realizing the way Jesus did it. Like he had to influence the whole world. How did he do it? Let's go deep with 12 guys for three years. And I think it's just freeing, you know. I, I love that book, by the way, that that you just announced. I've gone on Amazon already to look at it and and, and read oh. the description. It's uh, I, I'm definitely going to order it. Desizing the church, and I I don't think by any means I, I get a vibe f- from you that you think we should all be a small church. But I think it's about being a a healthy church and being happy with who you are, and and focusing on the quality of the relationships and not the the amount of bums on seats. I I, I just love it. The premise behind desizing is not that smaller is better or bigger is bad. It's that we need to make the push for numbers a smaller factor in our determination of church health than we've let it be. It's become almost the overriding factor for everything. We've got to make it less part of the equation than it has been. That size is is not as, as important as we used to believe that it was. So, But I wasn't wanting to make this an ad for that, but that's okay with folks I want to know about that. So I'm happy to be able to talk about it as well. Tell us about some, oh, actually, you mentioned earlier about five something. And when you said five, I thought fivefold ministry gifts, he has to be referring to that. I'm guessing that that's what you were referencing earlier. So how do how do the fivefold ministry gifts help us avoid burnout in the church? And then we'll get to the lightning round questions, and then we'll get to the bonus material, and we'll tell everybody again how they can get to that uh, before we conclude. Yes, of course. Well, I think that's very essential, the fivefold, because we're always, you know, we're using the word pastor here. And to be honest, that has confused me in the last 15 years. And I only have woken up to the reality that being a shepherd is not one of my main motivational gifts. If I look at the fivefold ministry gifts, but I've always try to behave like a shepherd because I thought I should, you know, I should be caring a shepherd for our people. And, and, and so I put a lot of pressure on myself in how to do that. And, and also people wanted me to be the pastor. And, and suddenly I realized I'm trying to be all things to all people. And if you're trying to be all things to all people, you end up being nothing to no one. And so I discovered a test, which I did by Alan Hirsch, you can get it online. I think it's only $10 or something. It's a, a five-fold test. And if you do that test, you will find your main two motivations within the five-fold. And so I discovered I'm actually an apostolic teacher. So I'm a, a pioneer guy. I pioneer things and I, I, I'm a leader uh, and I'm a teacher, but I'm not a manager. And uh, neither am I a shepherd or a prophet or an evangelist. I can do all those things but it's not my main. And then we discovered in our team, we did this with 24 of our leaders and and we discovered there is actually someone who is a shepherd. And we suddenly realized, well, she is a shepherd because the way she behaves and and people flock around her and the way she cares. And and, and suddenly we were realizing all these different shapes and forms. And and then we have a prophet in our midst and an evangelist. And so we started to do away with pastor titles and we're now just using function names. So we've removed all of the titles, Pastor Suts and So, and now we're just saying, this is Ian, he is our visionary leader, or this is Brenda, she is our pastor. And it's just very freeing for everyone involved. 
Great to hear that there's a way of uh, getting some preliminary assessments on the fivefold ministry gifts. We'll make sure we put a link to that in the show notes because I know that will be helpful to a lot of people because we're talking less about titles than we are talking about the way people function within the congregation. And even some of the arguments that are really prevalent in America about whether or not women can be pastors or so on, it almost always seems to be an argument over the title and not about the function. If someone is functioning in a pastoral role, in a shepherding role in the church, people seem to not mind whether it's a woman or a man, but the moment you give them a title, all of a sudden everybody starts bringing in all kinds of verses that we have these arguments over. But if we concentrate on the function and on the role rather than on the title, I think we can remove an awful lot of that conflict even that happens within the church and a lot of that confusion. A lot of conflict, a lot of confusion, and a lot of pressure. Because we've been going through a process now that's taken us the last three years. And it's been so freeing also for our church because they suddenly realized we don't have to expect everything from one guy or one woman. You know, we, we can, we are actually cared for by a multiplicity of ministries and ministers. Uh, we are now realizing that if we don't put all our eggs in the same basket, it's it's actually quite dangerous, isn't it? If you if you're expecting everything from one person, what if that person messes up? You know. <laughs> well, when they mess up, not if. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're we're setting them up for failure when we ask that of them because nobody's capable of it. Nobody but Jesus was capable of that. Yes. And as we all know, uh, one of the big complaints the disciples had about Jesus is how many breaks he took. <laughs> Bruh. He was always leaving to go spend time with the father. And they're like, hey, we got business to do. And he's going, no, no, my business is spending time with the father. Relax, guys. Wow, wow. I'll teach you how to do this as well. So at growahealthysoul.com, you've got a bunch of tools available. Can you tell us about one or two uh, off the top so that people can get an idea of what they'll find when they go there? All right. Yeah. So, for example, I'm focusing on relationships and uh, friendships. Pastors tend to be lonely, right? You, you mentioned it before. We, we tend to not want to talk to someone, but every person needs, needs a friend. And Jesus need, needed friends. And you can be friends with those in your team. Jesus had best friends, such as uh, Peter and James and John. And, and so there's a tool there to map out your, your friendships, to just think, who are my friends? And to go through that and pray about it, I think that's very helpful. Also, there are other things in, in the spiritual area, a certain way of praying with the Bible based on the methods of Ignatius of Loyola. It's helped me a lot to slow down with the scriptures. And, and so I put some things there as well that people can find out about. We'll put links to that in the show notes, but let's get to the lightning round question for you. We have four questions for you. First of all, what are the biggest changes you've seen in your field of ministry in the last few years, and how have you adapted to it? People are less keen to serve or volunteer in the church. I think that's around the world and for us as well. And we used to have a very top-down approach where we as the leaders needed to fill the rubber. And we're constantly asking people, chasing people, can you help with this? Can you help with that? And now we've, we flipped that around. So now we're saying, look, we are the church. We're gathering on Sundays. It doesn't matter how we gather. It matters that we gather. So now we're saying, who is here? Who is available? Uh, and we look at a, a bottom-up registration list rather than a top-down roster to fill. And so sometimes we have one person in the band. Sometimes we have 10 people in the band. And sometimes we have no band, but we put up a video. And it's a lot healthier for everyone. Uh, next one. What free resource like an app or a website has helped you lately that you would recommend for small church ministry? This book is, is helping me a lot. The Church as Movement. Oh, yeah. I, I interviewed uh, Dan White about that in one of, uh, one of my early podcasts. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I love that very much. And, and uh, also the test that I just mentioned by Alan Hirsch, the APEST five-fold test that's also very helpful it doesn't matter if you're a large or small church but it's important to know what is your main motivation so that you're not trying to be someone that you're not one what's the best piece of ministry advice you've ever received uh, that was a hard one to think about mm. but i think one of the ones that came to mind is the following and that is what you tolerate is what you teach mm -hmm. and it's not just ministry advice but also parenting yeah. Oh, yeah. advice and leadership advice. Yeah, and it goes along with what you pay for is what you promote. Like if the kids 
whining and crying and you give the just give them this to shut it up, then you're just teaching it, hey, if I make enough noise, I get that to, to shut up. Same way as in the ministry, if we if we give in to the uh, louder negative voices, we tend we end up paying them off and you end up getting more of that. So yeah, very good piece of advice. Exactly. Number four, what's the funniest or weirdest thing you've ever seen in church? Um, that was years ago that a youth pastor went crowd surfing and then broke his leg because he jumped into the crowd, but they didn't catch him and he fell on the, on the floor and he broke his leg. Oh, okay. I, yeah, is there any more about that circumstance that we can know? Because, wow, how, how does that come about that a pastor decides to crowd surf? Yeah, well, at least it was. Uh, they were having a lot of fun. Like, you know, everyone's still talking about it right now. So. <laughs> So, oh my goodness, that's amazing. All right. So how can people find you online if they'd like to follow up with you on anything? Yeah, they can find me on Instagram and also uh, at growahealthysoul.com. We'll put links to those in the show notes as well. And uh, we're going to pause and then we're going to come back with bonus content. So for those of you who would like to listen to the bonus content about how the church can help the pastor lead beyond burnout, go to carlvaders.com slash subscribe to become a support, to become a supporter or carlvaders.com slash subscribe to get our free newsletter. If you do either of those things, you'll get a link in our newsletter every single week that will get you to all of the bonus content so you can watch that on our YouTube channel for free. But thank you so much for being with us today, Ian. I really appreciate all the very, very practical advice. And we'll get to the bonus content soon for those who want to be a part of that as well. Thanks so much. It was a pleasure. This episode was produced by Veronica Beaver. It was edited by Phil Vaders. Original theme music was written and performed by Jack Wilkins of jackwilkinsmusic.com. The graphic design is by Solomon Joy. And me, I'm Carl Vaders, and I hope to talk with you again in the church lobby.